Amen. Good morning. We welcome everyone here this morning. We're glad that you're here and we look forward to all the Lord has to share with us this morning as we lift up the name of the Lord Jesus Christ together. I uh, just wanted to mention uh, uh, a couple of things by way of announcement. First of all, uh, just a reminder, the insert in your bulletin this morning is an opportunity if you would like to have a, an Easter lily placed on the altar and honor or in memory of a loved one, uh, you can fill it out and put it in the offering plate. And on the back of that is uh, just a reminder about our altar flowers. Uh, If you would like to sign up for a given week to do altar flowers in memory of someone, please do that as well. And uh, this morning's altar flowers are dedicated to the honor of Jack Barbie given by Carol and Jan Smith. Also, I wanted to mention to you that I put out in the back, uh, we just got them in, they're a little bit late, Uh, they were back ordered and they just came in this week. Uh, This is a devotional uh, booklet that goes from now until Easter and it's a a devotional that's based on the sermon series that I'm doing uh, through Lent and Easter. So if you want to kind of catch up and even read ahead a little bit to see where I'm going, uh, this would be a good place to do it. But I want to encourage you to pick one up. There's uh, some in the back here. There's some in the uh, narthex as you come in and also some on the table in the fellowship hall if you'd like to pick one up and, and uh, have the daily devotions uh, now through Easter. Uh, let's see. I think that's all I have by way of announcement, so I'll turn it over to Scott. Good morning. In your bulletin, notice that there are announcements uh, that we need to be aware of. Also, if you're a visitor, there's a in the pew in front of you, there's a tag that you, we'd like you to put your name on so we can know who you are. There's a blue card. If you have a prayer request, fill that out and uh, put it in the basket, the offering basket when it comes by, if you would. After services, we will have coffee and refreshments, so please stay and join us with that. And in the bulletin, you'll notice that the Warren Food Bank is needing bars of soap this month. That's what they've asked us to provide. Uh, Methodist men will be on um, March 26th. Last Sunday meal, March 27th, we'll eat well that weekend. Amen. And the Easter handbell cantata will be on April 10th. And also don't forget to sign the registration pad that's on the inside aisle of the pews and pass that to the outside so we'll know who all is here this morning. Are there any other announcements? Too early in the morning this morning for too much of that. If there's no announcements, then join me in the call to preparation this morning, which is uh, from Isaiah chapter 60. See, darkness covers the earth and thick darkness is over the peoples. But the Lord rises upon you and his glory appears over you. Nations will come to your light and kings to the brightness of your dawn. As we prepare our hearts for worship this morning, uh, the communion rail is now open for a time of prayer. If you would like to come forward and pray for our worship service or any personal needs that you might have, you may do so at this time. This is the opportunity when God challenges us to choose to enter the Holy of Holies and experience His presence for ourselves as we worship together. The communion rail is now open for a time of prayer.
And now let's bow together as we pray. Our gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you and praise you for another wonderful opportunity to come together in this place as the body of Christ and to come into your presence and experience worship together with you. We thank you and praise you that your Holy Spirit is already here moving among us and we commit and dedicate this service to you in everything we do. May Jesus Christ receive all the honor and the glory and the praise, for it's in his name we pray. Amen. Our opening hymn this morning is He Leadeth Me, hymn number 128 in our hymnal. We'll sing verses 1, 2, and 4 together. Let us stand as we sing. Affirmation of faith this morning is number 887 in the hymnal. It's from Romans chapter 8. We'll read it responsively. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? No. In all all things we are more than than conquerors through the one who loved us. We are are sure sure that neither neither death nor life nor nor angels, nor nor principalities, principalities, nor nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Thanks Thanks be to God. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. It's time for us now to share with our fellow members here our joys and our concerns. Does anyone have a concern that they need to share this morning, like to share? 
No concerns. How about Joyce? Uh, I guess it's a, a concern and a joy. Uh, Scott, I got a text from uh, Bill Meredith this morning. He just wanted us to know that uh, Tim and Janie are getting along pretty well, so uh, he just wanted to keep us up to date on them. So it's good news to hear they were doing good. I have a joy. Uh, my dad's going to be 95 on Wednesday, and that's why we got him the flowers. And Jan and Eddie Amen. are improving. Amen. Any other joys this morning? I've got one. I'll, I'm going to get to put in my garden today, I think. That's a joy. <laughs> it's also a concern. <laughs> so, uh, I, 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 go ahead and say some prayers for Kathy. Because I get some somewhat pushy out there in the garden, and, uh, and prayers for me that I don't overdo it. Amen. Any other joys, other than we all got up on time this morning? Amen. If not, ready? Let's bow together as we pray. Our gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you and praise you for this opportunity to join our hearts together and to come into your presence in prayer. We recognize that we are not worthy of your amazing love for us, so we humbly come before your throne. We confess to you all of our sins. We ask for your forgiveness. Cleanse us in the precious blood of Jesus Christ. Prepare our hearts to be the disciples that you've called us to be. And Lord, our hearts are burdened this morning for those in need among us, for those requests spoken here, those listed in our bulletin, and the unspoken request on our hearts. We ask that you would bring healing, comfort, and peace to your people today. We thank you that you are our great physician. You know and understand these needs even before we bring them before your throne. Your Holy Spirit is already at work moving among us, touching and healing hearts and lives. We thank you for the many answers to prayer that you have given us, for the joys that we shared, and we thank you most of all for your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ. And now as Jesus taught his disciples, we pray together. Our Father... Who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. We have a little serenade this morning because nobody told the chimes that, they, that the time change happened. So we'll try to let them know this week. At this time, I'd like to invite the ushers to come forward for a morning offering. And let's bow together for prayer. Our gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you for your many blessings upon us, for providing for our every need. And we thank you for walking with us moment by moment, day by day. And so we thank you now for this opportunity to give back to you. Bless these, our tithes and offerings, and may they be used to bring honor and glory to our Lord Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen.
Thank you. You may be seated. At this time, I'd like to invite the kids to come forward for our children's message. Let me get you guys to sit right here in the middle. Well, this middle. There you go. (laughs) Thank you. All right. Okay. I'm going to start off with, going to make some statements, and I want you to tell me if they're true or false. Okay, you ready? Polar bears, you know what a polar bear is. Polar bears do not have white hair. False? False? Everybody thinks it's false? Well, it's true. Polar bears have clear hair. And so whatever is in their surroundings, that's what color shows up. So when they're on the snow, which is where they spend most of their time, they're white. Yeah, that's right. But like when they get in the water, their hair turns darker because then it's the color of the water around them. And here's another one on polar bears. Polar bears have black skin. What do you think? (laughs) This might be a trick question, huh? It, that, that's right. They have black skin. So they've got clear hair and black skin. Now, here's another one. Eskimos have 100 different words for snow. What do you think about that? It's true. That's right. See, when they talk, when they use the word snow, it's a different word for when the snow is falling, a different word for what they make their igloos out of, a different word for everything that has to do with snow. They have their own individual word for those things. And because they live in the snow, they have a lot of words for snow. So now here's another one. Now, you know what the national anthem is when, like at a ball game, you stand up and Oh, say, can you see? That's our national anthem. Oh, you had to memorize all four verses? I was going to ask you, do you know how many verses there are? There's four. Well, here's another question about a national anthem. There are 158 verses of the Greek national anthem. So that's the national anthem they sing in Greece. What do you think, true or false? I guess they talk a lot, don't they? I mean, that's got to be the only reason they would have that many verses. Oh, well, good. See, you knew that one then. Now, here's one that's completely different. Elephants walk on their tippy toes. (laughs) So that you're catching on. That one is true as well, because when elephants walk, they each step, they start on their toes and then they roll back and they start on their toes. Now, when you don't usually notice that because they got these big feet and it just looks like they plop them down, but they actually put their toes down first. So they walk on their tippy toes. Yes. That's right. Their toes are stuck. So if they put the front of their foot down, it's automatically going to get their toes. So, you guys did pretty good on that. Now I want to tell you a story. There was once a man named Malchus, and he's in the Bible. And he was a servant for the Jewish high priest named Caiaphas. And there are some strange names, Malchus and Caiaphas. And here's another strange name. You might have heard this one, Gethsemane. Gethsemane is a place. Well, Malchus was in the Garden of Gethsemane. And he was a part of a group that had been sent there to arrest Jesus. So uh, he's there, and as Malchus starts to walk up to Jesus, and he's going to put his arms behind him and tie his hands together to take him away, Peter, Jesus' disciple Peter, pulls out a sword and he cuts off Malchus' ear. And uh, But then Jesus steps in, And says, Peter, put your sword away. 
They're here for me. Let them take me. I'm stepping up here. I don't want any trouble. And he takes Malchus's ear and he puts his back on his head and he heals him. So when Malchus is done, he's taken Jesus away and Jesus has healed his ear. So it's interesting because Jesus shows his love for Malchus, even though this man was seemed like a bad guy because he was coming to arrest Jesus. Jesus wanted to show his love for Malchus by healing him and healing his ear in spite of the fact that Peter had cut it off with a sword. So that teaches us a lot about Jesus and who he is. Even though it was a bad situation and they were there to arrest him, even though he'd done nothing wrong, uh, Jesus showed his love for Malchus and everybody because he wants us to know that he's, he died on the cross so that our sins could be forgiven. And I want to tell you that you need to remember that's a story from the Bible and we believe the Bible because it teaches us about Jesus. And that's another true statement because it comes from the Bible. Okay, let's have a prayer. Lord, thank you for loving us, teaching us things from your word, and help us to follow you, whatever we do. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you very much. You can go back to your seat. Now let's stand together for our hymn of praise, Savior, like a shepherd, lead us. Hymn number 381. We'll sing verses 1, 2, and 4 together. Please join me now in, in reading the scripture of today. It's from John 18, verses 1 through 11. After Jesus had spoken these words, he went out with his disciples across the Kidron Valley to a place where there was a garden, which he and his disciples entered. Now Judas, who betrayed him, also knew the place, because Jesus often met there with his disciples. So Judas brought a detachment of soldiers together with the police from the chief priests and the Pharisees, and they came there with lanterns and torches and weapons. Then Jesus, knowing all that was about to happen to him, came forward and asked them, Who are you looking for? They answered, Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus replied, I am he. Judas, who betrayed him, was standing with them. When Jesus said to them, I am he, they stepped back and fell to the ground. Again, he asked them, Whom are you looking for? And they said, Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus answered, I told you that I am he, 
So if you're looking for me, let these men go. This was to fulfill the word that he had spoken. I did not lose a single one of these, one of those who you gave me. Then Simon Peter, who had a sword, drew it, struck the high priest's slave and cut off his right ear. The slave's name was Malchus. Jesus said to Peter, put your sword back in its sheath. I am, am I not to drink the cup that the Father has given me? This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. Seated. Let's bow together for a moment of prayer. Our gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you this morning for your word. Open our spiritual eyes and ears that we may see and hear your truth for us today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. This year's Lenten series is called Witnesses to Christ. And it's a look at uh, some of the different characters that are a part of Jesus' life on his uh, journey to the cross and the interactions he had with these people along the way. The overall theme for this series is from John chapter 20, verses 30 and 31. So that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and by believing, you may have life in his name. So on this Lenten journey, we want to emphasize what it means to have life in his name. We will learn lessons from each of the witnesses who were present as a part of Jesus' journey to the cross. We'll meet some villains along the way, like uh, Barnabas and Pontius Pilate. We'll meet some sinners, like Peter, who denied him three times, Mary Magdalene, who was possessed by seven demons, and Judas Iscariot, who betrayed him. And we've already met uh, John the Baptist and Mary, uh, the sister of Martha and Lazarus. And so today we're going to meet Malchus the man who had his ear cut off by Jesus. But I want to begin with a true story. On January 17, 2004, a 66-ton whale died and was beached on the southwestern coast of Taiwan. Two weeks later, the authorities decided to try and load that whale on a truck and take it to a laboratory so they could do an autopsy to see why the whale died. It took 50 men, three lifting cranes, and 13 hours to hoist that whale up onto the back of this long, big, long truck. And then they had to drive the whale uh, downtown. People poured out into the streets to see this amazing, humongous whale on its way uh, to the downtown area where they would try to do an autopsy to see wh why the whale died. And then it happened. As the truck was crawling through the city, crowds looking on, the whale exploded. I can't even imagine what that must have been like. But that whale exploding spattered, we'll just say whale stuff, all over cars and buildings and people and the road. I mean, it was a humongous mess. Traffic was stopped for hours. And you can just imagine, on top of all the mess, the smell. But anyway, we won't talk about that anymore. But you know for sure, nobody saw that coming. That was totally unexpected. Well, I kind of see this whale explosion as a picture of life. We're going about our business and all of a sudden, a whale explodes somewhere along the way in our lives. We're left hurt, confused, lots of questions, and mostly why. Why did this happen to me? 
Why did this circumstance that was out of my control hit me so hard? Why did this child of mine have to die so young? Why did my life wife leave me? Why did I lose so much money? Why, why is my child continuing to cause our family so much pain? Well, for Malchus, his wail exploded in the Garden of Gethsemane. Verses 2 and 3. Now Judas, who betrayed him, also knew the place, for Jesus often met there with his disciples. So Judas, having procured a band of soldiers and some officers from the chief priests and the Pharisees, went there with lanterns and torches and weapons. So here Judas has set up in the Garden of Gethsemane for Jesus to be arrested. And we know that Judas was paid 30 pieces of silver to turn Jesus over. So the crowds gathered there. There's Romans who literally controlled the country, chief priests who were in control of the temple, and the Pharisees who basically controlled Jewish religion. Kind of like having the Supreme Court and Congress sending the FBI to arrest Jesus. A whole lot of big important people are there to arrest one man. And of course, we know who's leading the charge. It's Judas. And what is Judas up to? Well, we know Judas is the one who ultimately betrays Jesus. Every time we hear these words at communion, our Lord Jesus on the night when he was betrayed, well, this is that night. So the chaos commences. And then verse 10, Simon Peter, having a sword, drew it and struck the high priest's servant and cut off his right ear. So here we are in the midst of this confusing, tumultuous, chaotic situation. And Peter cuts off the high priest's servant's right ear. It's interesting that this man who uh, the Gospel of John names Malchus, uh, he's involved in this situation due to no control of his own. He is literally a slave of the high priest Caiaphas, and basically his boss says, here's what I want you to do. Go with these men, and I want you to arrest Jesus. So Malchus does as he's told. That's the only reason he's there. And in the midst of this whole chaotic experience, Peter slices off his ear. Literally, that was Malchus's whale exploding moment. All of a sudden, his life was going to be completely different having lost his ear. It, as we go through life and we have these often horrible, life-changing moments, things that are out of our control, sometimes you have to call your bank because all of a sudden your money's gone. Change your diet because of an illness. Call a lawyer because you're in legal trouble. Tighten your belt for your budget. Go to counseling because you've got a problem or an issue. A word of advice. When things like this hit you unexpected, don't give up. Don't ever give up. Because the most important thing in these situations is to recognize who is in control of your life. So let's look at our scripture and just see how this scripture today guides us in our, in our own lives. Judas, who arranged this whole scene here in the Garden of Gethsemane at the arrest of Jesus, it looks like Judas, the Jews, the Romans, they are the ones who are in control. 
They're the ones that have been sent. They have their orders. They are there to arrest Jesus, and nothing short of that will do. But in reality, they appear to be in control, but the truth is, Jesus is truly in control. Verse 4 from our passage says, Then Jesus, knowing that all this would happen to him, came forward. So Jesus recognizes and understands what's about to take place. He knows, according to God's plan, it's supposed to take place. So when all of these people arrive to arrest him, Jesus literally steps forward and he says, here I am. The control here is really clear. When his enemy comes, Jesus goes out to meet him. When Judas approaches, Jesus doesn't run, take cover, try to hide. When Peter strikes Malchus and cuts off his ear, Jesus commands Peter to be, put the sword away. Listen to what Jesus says in John chapter 10, verse 18. No one takes my life from me, but I lay it down of my own accord. Even though the powers of darkness are rising up against him, full throttle, Jesus is in control. In Matthew's gospel of this same incident, Matthew says... Jesus could have asked his father for more than 12 legions of angels. You know how many angels that is? Uh, One legion in the Roman army is 6,000 men. So 6,000 men times 12. Jesus could have asked for 72,000 angels to come. But Jesus doesn't need 72,000 angels. He knows his call is to be obedient. So what's the plan when the whale explodes in your life? If you follow popular wisdom, you should always seek to maintain control and be prepared for any situation. So following that wisdom, never board a plane without a parachute, Never leave the, ha- uh, the house without a gas mask. Never step on the crack and break your mother's back. So there you have it. Be prepared. Be ready to take control whenever life throws you a curveball. There's one problem with popular wisdom. It doesn't work. How do you take control of something that you have no control over? You can't. Would you like to have control? Well, rather than seek control, Jesus challenges us to relinquish our control. Give it all up. Let it go. Or in other words... Resign as being the CEO of the universe because you just can't do it. Give your entire mess, your entire exploded whale to Jesus. Even though we don't see it, Jesus is already in control. Listen to verse 9. This was to fulfill the word that he had spoken. Of those whom you gave me, I have not lost one. Jesus is calm because he trusts the word of the Father. He's so calm, his calmness should be contagious. I read a Peanuts cartoon one time where Lucy is struggling with her Sunday school memory verse. And finally she says she must be having trouble with it because it's a verse from the book of reevaluations. Well, I think that's a pretty interesting name for the book of the Bible because the Bible does call us to reevaluate our lives. Helps us understand that we are not in control, God is. 
And the sooner we learn to live and walk a Christian life, giving God control of what comes our way, then we will begin to learn what it means to have Jesus Christ as our Savior and Lord. John 129. Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Who's in control of sin? Jesus Christ. And he takes it all away. John 4.14 Whoever drinks of the water that I will give him will never be thirsty again. Christ is in control of our aching eternal thirst. He quenches it with his unconditional love. John 8, 12. Jesus says, I am the light of the world. Think about that for a minute. If Jesus is control in control of the light, then he's also in control of the darkness. When parents send their kids to camp, they have to sign a form. And it has this important question, who is the responsible party? Should Johnny break his arm or Susie all of a sudden get measles or mumps or some strange thing that always seems to happen at camp? Who is the responsible party? Parents have to sign that form to say that they will be responsible should something happen. Well, Jesus Christ literally signs the form for our lives, and he writes it in his blood. When the whale explodes in our lives, <clears throat> Jesus is the responsible party. Not us. It's his job to see us through. He is the shepherd. We are the sheep. He is the bridegroom. We are the bride. He is our rabbi, we are his disciples. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. So right now in each and every life here, there's one of three things that are happening. We are either heading into or heading for a whale explosion. We're in the middle of of a whale explosion or we have just come through a whale explosion. Jesus Christ challenges us to stay calm, recognize who's in charge, and he offers to help us with his perfect peace. He reaches out his hand to heal us like he healed Malchus's ear. If you don't believe that Jesus can reach out in love even in extreme circumstances, just ask a man named Malchus. Let's bow together for prayer. <clears throat> Lord, we thank you this morning for your word. We thank you for the reminder that we are not in control. Jesus Christ is in control. And may we be reminded daily to trust, put our trust and our faith in him. We thank you for your constant presence with us. And may we constantly let go of the control that we try to have and allow Jesus Christ to walk us through the most difficult circumstances in life. We give you all the honor and the glory and the praise. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. As we close our service this morning, our closing hymn, Jesus, keep me near the cross. Let us stand together as we sing just the first verse.
Amen. Just a reminder, refreshments immediately after the service, and then we invite you to to a Sunday school class. Um, We are excited uh, about your presence here this morning. I'm just proud of you for getting up an hour earlier than you should have had to. That's what, that's the only thing I don't like about moving the clock forward. I lost an hour's sleep and I'm very protective of my sleep. But I'm, so I am very proud of you for being here this morning and joining us for worship. And now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all forevermore. Amen. Amen. 